Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, March 3rd, 2022, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome. Welcome back to us, I guess, this week. Sorry, we were off last week. Uh, for those of you who uh, didn't see our postings on social media, I apologize for uh, for the last minute cancellation of last week's episode. Uh, we had too much going on, but we are back this week, at least me and my co-host here, Jeremy Williams. We're doing a duo cast this week. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm all right. Where's Kishore? Sure, I think he's busy. He's work. He's got a full time. We all have full time jobs. My God, uh, I, I think he's traveling, he's saving the world somewhere. Um, but yeah, he's doing probably more important work. Uh, he's 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 waiting for Futurama to come back because they they did announce that Don John DiMaggio has signed on. Uh, finally, they resolve the contractual hiccups. You you weren't here on the episode when we talked about this, but Futurama is coming back. All the original cast and everything, creative team, uh, except for the voice of Bender, probably the arguably the most uh, important voice, uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the one of the most popular characters in the show. Yeah, and it was due to contract um, disputes, you know, misalignments. How can I diplomatically say it? They, they, they. It was about money, uh, but they figured it out. So. Uh, Futurama will be back at some point. That's probably what Kishore is waiting for. The biggest hey. Futurama fan we know. And presumably Kishore will be back as well. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. I hope so. I haven't, <laughs> heard, I haven't heard from him in three days. So I don't know. Yeah, I better check in on him after the show. Maybe he'll listen to this. Kishore, come back. Come back. But I'm glad you're here, Jeremy, because this is going to be a very Steam Deck centric episode one of the reasons we couldn't record i was too busy to record last week was i was working on my steam deck review filming that and just ran out of time um, to do the podcast but uh, a lot of the questions that have come up maybe from you jeremy uh, <laughs> since you've yet to use one i believe still let's make this clear norm you didn't do a steam deck review you shot <clears throat> recorded directed edited a steam deck movie that is a one hour long TV special. <laughs> I mean, that was a that was a short film. Not it, it, even that it, it, short. <laughs> six, it was sixty eight minutes and then was, fifty odd some yeah, odd seconds. It's pretty serious, and I understand that was like the 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 cut. Like uh, the director's cut was actually an hour and a half. Uh, yeah, and, and and I did two takes. So <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll give you a, a little glimpse of how it worked because I also, you know, even though I say I didn't have time to do the podcast, I, I confess. One thing I did end up having time to do was guest on TechPod, Will's podcast. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, because he had uh, he also did an episode about the Steam Deck. Uh, neither he, him or Brad, who hosts that show, um, have used it. But he had me and Wes Fenlin of PC Gamer, who reviewed it for them for PC oh. Gamer, guests on the show. And so, yeah, like it, while I was in Steam Deck, like. Honestly, it, it was a combination of not having enough time to record this only a test and being yeah. stressed out about that, but also like kind of looking forward to guesting for, you know, just that quick 45 minute spot on Will's show because I could talk to Wes about <laughs> his experiences as well and get some of the thoughts percolating in my mind, like what I wanted to say uh, about it and just help, help me digest my own feelings about it. Uh, but after recording that episode of TechPod uh, that night, I basically, I film a lot of these reviews now, not where I'm standing or not where I'm sitting here in my office, but in Danica's office. She has uh, what we call the room requirement in this house. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a Harry Potter reference. It's it's what's needed. Sometimes it's toy storage for the kids. Sometimes it's for her crafting projects or resume. I love it. But we have a big table in there with a giant cutting mat. It's like a three feet by six feet cutting mat that I can use to put a 3D printer, do do, uh, do product reviews. So I've kind of co-opted it from time to time, set up my lighting, set up my stuff, and film my reviews there. And I lock myself in that room for three and a half hours to film this. Film just the talking pieces to camera. And I got a, I got a off camera, I had a pot of tea, and I had some, uh, some Ricola, some cough drops, some honey co flavored cough drops, and I flipped on this very camera and just ugh, word vomited for about an hour and a half. And then I stopped the camera and I said, 
hmm, I could do that better. And I press the record button again, and it wow. went for again, and it lasted almost about the same time, hour and a half. And I then, didn't know you did that. I think oh, of you oh, as yeah. one take Chan, because mm, how many how many times did we shoot like our our <laughs> VR show? Yeah, and and then I'm like driving home, and I'm like, Norm, I feel really bad about that episode. <laughs> Can we shoot that again? And and you're like, Yeah, I guess we could if you want, if you really yeah, feel like we need to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's great. That that makes me know that you are human, and I appreciate that. Well, I update the firmware, and sometimes there's a regress- regression in the firmware. So <laughs> that's an inside joke about the Joy Cons or the joysticks on the Steam Deck. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, uh, recorded it twice, and then hunkered down on the edit station. And I'd done earlier in the week all my B-roll. So the way I think about this is, I know I'm gonna. I know people want to hear about the Steam Deck. I know my approach to these reviews is to be as comprehensive as I can. I'm not gonna do the. In, I'm not able to do like some of that in-depth benchmarking that you know Digital Foundry or Gamers Nexus. I don't have some of that gear or you know the, the, some of the comparison devices. I don't have an IA Neo, for example. But I can give my impressions on how I use it. And some of that audience out there may not be as familiar with some of the other coverage. So I got to recap some of the broader stuff and then yep. kind of dive deep into my personal experiences. But it just goes on. And you know what? Recording a podcast kind of helps get the thoughts out. So. You know, talking for an hour about a, th- a thing I'm kind of knee deep in and been thinking about for the past two weeks, not that difficult. Uh, and then, of course, film some example B-roll and, and uh, a video of of, this, of the the device and the games itself. So put that piece together. It's on the site. You can watch it. It's on YouTube um, and end up being from hour and a half cut down to about 70 minutes. So I was pretty happy with it. Yeah, it was it was very informative. I watched it in about three chunks throughout the day. And uh, I really, I it answered almost all of my questions, although I did have some more for you. Oh, and we'll, and we'll get to those today. Uh, but I, I will give you a pro tip, and I have no problems with it. I, when I listen to podcasts, when I watch videos, on it, I listen to them at 1.5 speed. Oh, yeah. I watch videos at sometimes even two speed, depending on how much coffee I've had that morning. Or how uh, slow the person sp- talks. Like It depends on the person. It, it, it screwed my brain up completely. I t- I've talked to Joey about this, pulling back the curtain, and I've listen to interviews I've done or podcasts I've recorded. And when I'm talking, I can't listen to myself at 1x speed. I have to listen to myself at 1.5x speed. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like I'm thinking faster than the words are coming out of my mouth. Yeah. And, and when the words are slowly coming out of my mouth to avoid the ums as much as possible and I'm rewatching it, I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Okay. no, 1.5x speed. Yeah. So I'm very tempted always to speed up the videos. Sometimes I do. People notice. <laughs> uh, okay, before we dive into, uh, hopefully, I, I think we'll, we'll have at least half an hour to answer questions about the Steam Deck. Um, there are a couple things off the top that I did want to cover. One, Jeremy, I heard What's from up? you over Slack that you finally got a chance to watch Ghostbusters Afterlife. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I caught, caught up. Like That came out a while ago now. In fact, like the year it comes out is featured in the movie, and I fell a little bit behind. But uh, yeah, I, I gave it a 10 out of 10. Like, I honestly, I was really surprised because I know you'd, you'd loved it. But yeah. I also knew that you'd visited the set and there was a relationship there. And so I, I had to imagine, okay, like he, there's some personal interest in liking it. Like when you know some of the people involved or you, you're, you're really intimately familiar with the quality of the, of the sets and the props, you know, in, in terms of like the Ghostbusters recreations, there's, there's a level of like, of subjectivity. Involved. Appreciation. Uh, don't call me not subjective. Don't call, you're, don't call <laughs> me biased, objective. Jeremy. But n- not objective. Don't call me biased. I will. I will concede that yeah. being on set allows me to appreciate some of the nuanced details more. Right. Or, or I can say, like, oh, I know how much work they put into building this set or on this specific shot. But I would even go. I would go far to say uh, that actually negatively if, could can could negatively affect my kind of my my ability to appreciate the storytelling as a whole because I'm so. Mm often thinking about things like watching a trailer you know i'm thinking about the things i saw um that you know but that that could that takes away from the magic of it you know the magic of seeing it for the first time seeing those scenes hearing those lines for the first time norman jan it. is objective okay that you you've heard it from me he's objective you heard it from him but we also heard that norman jan is human so i'm just saying that it's possible that you know you you see something up close it it has more meaning to you so when you see the movie maybe you give that element a little edge when it comes to your you know your review score like I, data I'm and first saying, contact touching the phoenix you know it's great human touch so 
when I saw the Rotten Tomatoes didn't love it like as much as you did, I, I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll go in this with my you know expectations tempered. But I freaking loved it. I thought like I would posit that this movie is the best recreation of an 80s vibe that I've seen. Like from Stranger Things to Ready Player One to, you know, I mean, I mean, Dune doesn't count, right? Because that's like a completely different scope. But like all the all the the 80s resurgence that's been happening, I feel like there have been some real good attempts at recreating that vibe. But this takes the cake. Like I feel like they just they nailed it. I kept expecting them to take uh, you know, to make dramatic <clears throat> pauses and shortcuts and tension that you would see in modern films, but it's just so gratifying. Like moment to moment, this film, like it, it just worked for me. The, the only thing that didn't work quite so much is some of the, you know, the acting from the, from the kids, but I, that's always been what? an issue of mine. And, and, and I, I, like, I don't want to be mean, like these are kids and, and they're, they're, they're so good. They're great at what they do. And almost all of them are, are, but the, this, the, I don't, you know, one of them just kind of bug, rubbed me the wrong way. And was it podcast? Was it podcast? No, no, no. Podcast is like a hero in my family. Everybody loved him. Yeah, like that's, that's right. He's by Even my wife was like, I, that kid is great. Like halfway through the film, she was singing his praises. First acting job. No kidding. First, first movie. I think the last, the first only thing he was in before that, Logan Kim's the actor, uh, was like a FedEx commercial, like a, a corporate video <laughs> or something as a kid. But wow. yeah, he's amazing. A revelation. I think Phoebe also, McKenna Grace, I, uh, the lead girl, I, yeah. I thought she was fantastic. I did too. I liked her too. So I guess that, <laughs> that I guess that leaves the guy from Stranger Things. I'm not my favorite. Like I'm not crazy about this guy's acting, but you know, he he kind of plays. He's kind of well suited for the role. He's kind of typecast that way. So I I, I think it's fine. Um, uh, anyway, great great. I just loved it. I thought it was, you know, just knocked it out of the park in terms of like giving me that Ghostbusters vibe that I wanted. And the ending is great. Oh my god, tears! Right? Yes, you got the feels. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm surprised you didn't start with the emotional resonance and you went with the because I appreciate that. I think the emotionally, it, it's. It knocks out of the park. It lands. And then the thing that Jason Redman's talked about is how important was it for the movie to earn the the feelings at the end, the hug at the end. Yeah. It's so important. I think he, they achieved that. And what's everyone, it's what I certainly gravitate toward. But the fact that you went to say that this movie did the 80s vibe better than a lot of those other 80s, that's also a very Jason Reitman thing. He does the family movie, the you know, the car, car trip movie and the opening. That's very Jason Reitman. Uh, Amblin, I think it's a short way of saying what he did mm. well. The Amblin mm-hmm. vibe, right? The mm-hmm. Goonies vibe um, with these kids on an, an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Even the music cues. I mean, obviously they lifted a lot of that from the Ghostbusters soundtrack, but it was they were so well done. And I just felt like they, they really got it. And I, the perfect the perfect director, you know, for yeah. this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm so glad you enjoyed that. I uh, just wanted to check in with you since I know it. Been, <laughs> you, you, how about the family? Uh, for those who would not maybe appreciate the original Ghostbusters as much. Oh, my daughter, certain- my twelve-year-old daughter, just cracked up the whole time. She loved it. It and it wasn't too scary, you know. But it was like that, le- like threshold level of like this kind of tension. And there's some a couple, maybe there's probably some jump scares in there. But it was like funny and scary and the perfect mix, just like Ghostbusters was. Yeah, um, which I, I love. Did you happen to look up um, Ivan Reitman's uh, contribution? To the film that I talked about two weeks ago? I didn't. I remember okay. you said... No, that's no, all. That's yeah. all. Okay. But okay. but it, it's worth looking up once you see the film. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you started off by saying, you know, the movie, the year the movie is set in is in the film. I'll give you a little bit of behind the scenes. Yeah. Is uh, you're talking about, and then there are minor spoilers here, when they're in what's called Gozer's Temple. It's an underground cavern, a temple to... Gozer, the Gozerian, the villain of Ghostbusters 1, uh, there are year markers etched on the walls for these big events, for like the, the, the meteorite crash in Russia and, and you know, the world wars, right? These big significant milestones that are prophesied. And one of them, that, or, you know, there are years in the future as well, but one of them is the year 2021, right? The year the movie is set in. I'll tell you, that's a CG edit. <laughs> Why? Was it going to come out in 2020? It was going to come out 
in, I believe, summer of 2020. Oh, that's funny. Because uh, we were on set 2019, <laughs> August 2019, and we visited that set. That is uh, on a, in a studio soundstage. They built out that full interior. It's incredible. Wow. That statue of Gozer. We, we saw people on um, artists, on uh, scenic decorators, on uh, cherry pickers, um, like spray painting and painting that big Gozer. Uh, but they had the etching in that mausoleum and... It's. I have a photo. I, I have a photo of it saying 2020. <laughs> so in the film, very, very uh, uh, cleanly edited into 2021. Yeah, so. interesting. Because they never say that year. And I, no. I thought that was odd. And so I did wonder, did, was there an, an, a cut there or something? Was it in the script and they removed it? And maybe it was. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I actually, did they never say it? In my mind, they said it. And it sounded like, I was like, oh, they ADR'd it. But maybe they didn't say it. It was just the visual edit. But yeah, yeah. Very, very clever indeed. Uh, I hope there's a sequel. Um, I think it was a financial success. Uh, did better than uh, I think a lot of people expected at the box office. Uh, speaking of box office and big releases, uh, The Batman is out this week and uh, the reviews embargo lifted. So it's on Rotten Tomatoes, I believe, in the high 80s. Well, Last I checked, start off in the uh, mid 90s. So uh, just from the headlines from the reviews, I didn't want to spoil anything about this. Uh, it, it sounds like. It, universally positive from Batman fans and DC movie fans. So I'm very looking forward to seeing this nearly three hours long. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Uh, if you don't want to make it to a theater, it'll be on HBO max April 19th, I believe. So it has a, like a six weeks uh, exclusivity window in theaters. But I'm going to try to make it to IMAX at some point and find a, find a showing after the kids go to sleep or something. Cause I, I'm really, really excited for this. Yeah. I'll be curious to hear what you and Kishore say about it. Michael Giacchino did the score, and that score is on Spotify, I believe, now. And it's just, I've been listening to a few pieces from that. Again, not to spoil too much, because I don't want to get all the music cues, but the, Michael Giacchino did a really great job with the, the main theme of, of Batman. And Batman themes have been very important, associated with the, the character and the film representations. Uh, the other reviews embargo that lifted, not Steam Deck, uh, last reviews embargo we'll talk about is for Galactic Star Cruiser, we've, which we've talked about on the show. <laughs> we got to talk. And this is where I miss Kishore because I know Kishore and I and you would have a lot of fun talking about this. But this is that Walt Disney World Hotel, Star Wars theme. It is a full immersive experience starting at, let's not bury the lead, starting at over $5,000 for a two-night stay for two adults. If you want to bring a kid, it jumps up to $6,000. And Disney uh, invited uh, two weeks ago, I want to say, uh, reviewers, influencers, some podcasters uh, to spend the two nights and two days experiencing <laughs> it and, and and talking about their, their, uh, their time and, and video. There was video uh, released even. Because that was one of my favorite lines in Ghostbusters, by the way, when podcast says, you can be anything you want, an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's the pinnacle. That's yep. the ultimate achievement. That's I mean, the it's dream. Sad. It's, it's sad, <laughs> but you know, there, there are more kids that want to be influencers than, than astronauts, right? But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the reviews embargo lifted. I've read a few of them. I listened to a couple of podcasts. I listened to the people who did go. Uh, I assume you haven't, Jeremy, but it did answer a few questions I had about it. So obviously I, I can't evaluate you know, how much it's, you know, whether the experience is worth it, but there was one overwhelming takeaway, which was that because the experience is enclosed, right? You enter right. through the main entrance, you're taken on a transport ship to their, you know, to a <laughs> sh fictional ship in space, everything from every room you're in, your, your cabin to the bar scene to the training areas, the the bridge of the ship, the places you're allowed to explore, there are no windows. Yeah. There well, are screens. Yeah, exactly. There are things that look like windows. Right. And even for a two-day, two-night experience, people felt it was claustrophobic. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I could imagine that. I mean, the the that is a that is a huge risk. And I get it. Like if you're gonna make an experience, you don't want to be beholden to the weather. Like, you know, you want this hotel to have the exact same experience, tailor-made every day of the year, every year. And that's that's how they kind of got there. It's like they they enclosed it and they made it a two-day long ride, essentially. Like a two-day long, you know, rise of the resistance experience. And that's that's a bold 
choice. And I, you know, if, if it works for some, and I'll bet you it will work for kids. I think for them, who, they, the kids who basically have, as you know, probably you and I did to a large extent, have grown up on screens. Like they're used to screens. They like looking at screens. The fact that a Windows is screen is probably a benefit. They'd probably, <laughs> they're probably in, into that. Like that's cool. Um, especially given all those small bits of interactivity that you can do when you approach those windows and things. Um, but but I could see adults feeling like this is too much. Yeah, yeah. And even the windows, you know, there's passive activity. It's not just a, a, a starscape. They'll like in your cabin, you know, if you open the blinds or whatever and and see the space, one, there's no parallax. So you lose a little bit of that magic. Like technology is not there to give you a simulation of parallax. So you are just hmm. looking at a screen behind glass, right? But there's animation. You'll go into hyperspace. Planets will pass by. I think in one of the windows, you can call up a, a, a droid and, and have some type of AI interaction. Um, there's nonstop activities that are, and scheduled activities and spontaneous events. So very much a, the kind of immersive experience where they scripted out things that happen. And everyone's in character. All the cast members are in character. I don't know if they're wearing the cast member name tags, though. Right. Yeah, I have. I don't know either. But I, I one thing that I did see consistently was that they're doing a great job. That the cast members are, you know, in character. There's a lot of role playing, and yeah. that they're they're doing their best to make this experience, you know, as fun as possible for the guests. And that's cool, given that they've had no practice. You know that this is like that. This is opening night for them. I, I bet you know Rise of the Resistance is training ground for that because mm. you've you've done Rise and yeah. there's a segment in Rise where there's a bit of role playing that goes on and the cast members have to stay in character and they get all sorts of interaction. Um, you know, kids and when parents have to talk to them and you know they play along and I, I think maybe the the, the local you know, local acting background, local improv background probably helps and rise of resistance uh, time on that ride probably helps get you more time or opportunities to work at Galactic Star Cruiser. Um, you know it's the first place you're gonna see the the lightsaber that Disney developed that Ray uses there, but I think like uses at a distance like in a scene on a you know far away or something like you're not really allowed to get up close to it. Uh, you're encouraged to cosplay, apparently, because you're on there. And it was weird seeing some of these blogger photos because you had people, families were invited and kids in normal shorts and t-shirts mixed with some attendees in robes and, you know, and and right. and Disney bounding and Star Wars bounding uh, is it, gear. Is that what it's called? When, Disney bounding. Yeah. Because when you go to uh, the, the Star Wars land, uh, what is it called? Nebula? Jakku. No, Jakku. Oh no, no, sorry. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, Black Spire Outpost. It's, right. When you go there, um, you're not allowed to dress like a Jawa. Like you can't dress like a cast member. What might as a you know as a you know a character from Star Wars. You have, but there are boundaries, and there's a whole website dedicated to describing where that line is. And is, so, is that does that is that still the rule when you visit the hotel? I believe you get more opportunities to cosplay. You can mm. lean more into it uh, because you wear certain identifiers to let you know that you're part of, you're a guest in the experience. Yeah, uh, They do take you to uh, Batuu um, on, on a shuttle, so a bus that's themed. So you enter the cargo hold of like the, the back of a truck, essentially, uh, and, and you get driven you know, from your shuttle to flown to Batu, uh, and you spend the time. So you, I don't know if you get to cut the line or like a, the fast pass line for rise. I hope, so. or, I hope so too. If you're paying that much, right, and you have limited time because you got to get back to your you know, your Halcyon Star Cruiser, uh, but you're also still wearing your identifier to say that you are on. You're here visiting from that ship. Oh. And when you're wearing that identifier, other cast members uh, at Galaxy's Edge will come up to you, and you get extra interaction. So more of the story comes out. Yeah. 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 Uh, so do, yeah. does it make you want to go any more than you wanted to go last week? No. That's my problem too. Like I can't believe that there's a Star Wars hotel that I'm not itching to visit. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, the the, the photos and the videos, I, it was cool to seeing a lot of the performers in like full, you know, Greedo costume and dancing and stuff and I'm sure that's nice, but uh, I feel like it's it's made for kids. Like yeah, I've maybe done that's it. immersive experiences before. We did the speakeasy, which we talked about, and I feel like that was the made more designed for adults, and I, I enjoyed that more, much more. And 
maybe because I'm less familiar with that 20s world than I am with the Star Wars world, knowing the Star Wars world and seeing the holes of you know the where the places where Disney can't cover up the exit signs and stuff just takes takes some of that magic away. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the Star Trek equivalent would be uh, more appealing to you? Well, there was a Star Trek equivalent. Star Trek: The Experience was the Star Trek equivalent, and that wasn't a hotel stay, but that was immersive. And you had you know actors and casts and interactions with fans and a ride, and that was the perfect length. And after that, you could go to Quark's Bar and then the Promenade on DS Nine. I, I feel like that's that was uh, I I even as a kid, I enjoyed that so much, so much. I don't, not so much more than what I'm seeing out of here, but mm-hmm. like you had actors in Klingon. You know, makeup and and uh, and Borg makeup, walking through and interacting and 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 taunting uh, the, the the patrons of the bar, and I felt like that that gave me enough of the Star Wars experience hmm. for this. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Hey everyone! Before we continue on this week, I want to let you know that this is only a test is made possible this week from the Stack Overflow podcast, which you should check out. Wondering which skills you need to break into the world of technology or level up as a developer? Curious about how the tools and framework you use every day were created? The Stack Overflow podcast is your resource for tough coding questions and your home for candid conversations with guests from leading tech companies about the art and practice of programming. For 13 years, the Stack Overflow podcast has been exploring what it means to be a developer and how the art and practice of software programming is changing our world, as I'm sure has been changing in their industry as well. The show dives into topics that matter from a listenership of developers, tech enthusiasts, and educators of all stages of their careers at this moment, and provides tangible tools and conversations about the infrastructure in tech right now. With new episodes twice a week, the show dives into topics like Web3, code security, cloud infrastructure, and how AI can solve real-world problems, and more. Listen at stackoverflow.com slash podcasts, or at any major podcast platform now back to the show yeah um okay let's talk about steam deck steam deck (laughs) steam deck steam deck where do you want to start jeremy um how about how it feels in your hand because that's the first thing that i want to i haven't experienced that i want to know most of all when you pick it up is it heavy it's i mean it's heavier than a switch if you if you're used to playing a switch which is a pound and a half oh sorry under a pound it's like 900 0.9 0.9 pounds, 0.88 pounds or something like like that uh, on the original Switch. And you go to that to a pound and a half for the Steam Deck, mm-hmm. it, it feels heavier. I will say that it looks heavier than it is because okay. it's so big, right? It's it's bulky. There's, yeah. I mean, you, know, you, you watch the scene right now. The It sticks up above when you lie it on the table. It actually has this under like you know under volume because the grips are so so voluminous. Um, it is it is a big device. I'm preparing but, myself for picking up the original Xbox controller, you know the <laughs> the Duke. Before, because as as you recall, the U.S. received a big Xbox controller and Japan got a smaller one. And then when everyone started importing the Japanese one, they said this is so much better. And Microsoft yeah. eventually switched over worldwide. Yeah. So do you feel like? We're at the cusp of being able to pull this off, and the, the like. The only problem here is that it's a little bigger than you want it to be, and that this will iterate very, very well as as they're able to shrink it down. The iteration is a really interesting point of discussion. I think it's as big as it needed to be because one, they wanted the controls to feel comfortable, right? Like they could have taken volume out of the grips, I think, and have it more slim. That they had these 3D printer prototypes that they release images of. But then it wouldn't be comfortable to hold because you have to make the grips bigger so that it is comfortable from mm. an ergonomic standpoint to hold because the things you can't get away from are the seven-inch screen and the SOC, the AMD SOC, and the cooling needed. Right? There's only so much you can reduce in battery. It's a 40-watt-hour battery. The Switch has a 16-watt-hour battery. It's more than twice the capacity of the Switch's battery because it's consuming... Uh, up to 25 watts. So all of the size, form factor, and we're talking about trade-offs and design decisions is oriented around the fact that they designed this to run off this AMD APU that they decided, unlike every handheld previously known 
in this modern gaming space and every laptop, it runs at the same max power consumption and processing speed when it's plugged in and when it's not plugged in. That design tenant guided, I think, so much of the design of the Steam Deck. Hmm. What what uh, game controller would you most compare the feel to when you are actually uh, playing the games? Xbox, easily. The thumbsticks are very Xboxy. Uh, D pad buttons. I think the, the the candy buttons. ABX wire. It's a little smaller than Xbox. Um, and an Xbox controller, you have these the offset analog sticks, though. Yeah, yeah. So, and they're not there, right? They're it's not. symmetrical. Yeah, but didn't bother me. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I did favor the thumbsticks over the D pad. Mm-hmm. You know, for people who solely play D-pad, uh, the D-pad will require a little bit more of a of a extension on your thumb than thumb six. So my, the natural f- resting spot for my fingers or my thumbs were the thumb sticks, and then the D-pad, and then the the um, touchpad. Yeah, is in a c- position where your thumbs thumbs are a little more curled, uh, but it's good because you want that kind of thumb tip precision of where you're placing your your you know dragging that mouse cursor. Yeah, I guess my the biggest question besides how's it feel in your hand that I have is compatibility. Because yeah. in my mind, like I bought the Steam controller immediately and Steam Link immediately, but I didn't end up using them because the gap between you know picking up, you know, turning on the game and getting it to work correctly was just too fiddly. Like I, you ha- there were there was a configuration step involved that. You know, uh, maybe a, a younger person, maybe somebody with more patience, I don't know, would have had no problem with. But I just want, the, for the same reason that I prefer the, the Oculus Quest to PC VR, I just want to be able to pick up and go. I want to be in the game as fast as possible with as little friction as possible. So I understand that, that Steam has incorporated a, a, you know, a database of controller configurations for off-the-shelf PC games. Is that an automatic thing? What is the process like for when you boot up Hades or whatever you're going to play, and you, and it, you know, and being able to play as if it were a game that was designed for the that interface? Yeah. So one, the Steam Link comparison is about remote play, right? And I think remote play, which I hugely advocate, because it's I think for remote play is a fantastic experience if you have. These decent, decent Wi-Fi in your house, especially if you have a modern graphics card. If you have like an NVIDIA card, you have the the hardware decoding or hardware encoding a video on your PC. If you have Steam Link or if you have the Steam app on your Steam Link app on your iPhone, remote play is so good. Um, and but it's not without its hiccups. There's still launchers that occasionally, you know, if, if I'm launching a game for the first time after installing it, right, you'll have the windows pop up of do you want it to allow permissions or your network or and some things that require me to go to my desktop and click an OK button before it works perfectly. That's mm-hmm. still a thing with remote play. Um, I don't see it as a that much of an inconvenience. But when you're asking about like the verified games, so you know how Steam or Valve is actually going through and certifying games if you get the green check mark you're clicking play and there's no other thing to select you're in the game you're in the main game in in, in the game menu as long as it would take for it to load up on your pc uh you'll see some text on the bottom of the screen where it'll say you know creating proton files you know simulating direct x or something to that extent uh but there's no additional you know run in this compatibility mode or um and even during a loading screen it'll say like this is using from our database touchpad controls or uh, thumbstick controls and you'll get like a visual indicator of like ooh focus on using your thumbsticks um, but then you can always adjust that anytime in the menu and that's because, automatic the first time you boot it sort of loads the best what they yeah. think the best configuration yeah part, right. part of that verification is that the input configuration has a recommended input profile that will automatically load when when you have that um, when a great. game doesn't have the green check mark and it has the yellow which is playable which means it'll run but it might need you know, some uh, some additional uh, input. It might mean like clicking an OK button, or you have to type your name in. Is the most common thing. Uh, then you might have to use the touchpad or pull up the virtual keyboard. Um, you know, with the shortcut Steam plus X, uh, and then type in something. But even for that part, those games ran, and then it's a matter of you know configuring the game for performance. Is there any kind of a speech to text for typing things in? No. Just just a virtual keyboard. On screen keyboard. Uh, on screen keyboard, sorry. On screen keyboard, Bluetooth keyboard, you can plug in. It's interesting because you can boot into Linux, the Plasma, uh, KDE Plasma interface, and there is no 
on-screen keyboard yet in there. So hmm. there you have to plug in a keyboard or use a wireless keyboard. Um, and so, <laughs> you heard my review toward the end. I said there's, there's this weird dichotomy, right? Like it's it's running SteamOS, but the front end, they call the deck UI that it boots into, which is like you know, their equivalent of a console UI. It's seamless. There's minor hiccups here and there. They've been updating it constantly. Uh, but there are things that you can't do in there that kind of require you, if you're a PC user, to go boot into Linux to do, like change resolution of output from HDMI. Or if you want to drag new files in there and play a mod or something, you'd have to go in the, into, into Linux. Um, there, there are things that they just haven't fully baked into the deck UI, even though there's a lot of customization. You know, you have your, your your performance indicators. You have your battery, your your, uh, your tweaks for you know, maxing out TDP. You have night mode. All that stuff is is just as if you were playing an Xbox or a Switch using your thumbsticks and going through the menus or the touchscreen. Yeah, I was surprised you told me that there's no access to the BIOS either, which makes yeah. us a, a very unique PC because <laughs> I can't think of any other manufacturer that doesn't give that to you. Yeah, and and maybe they'll un- unlock it or uncover it, like even. The Linux desktop right now, they are protected files and special special admin access you have to unlock because you could potentially, you know, you could brick it if you yeah. <laughs> you get to re-image it, right? Um, I, I could also imagine there simply isn't any kind of interface to the BIOS. Like it may just be something that is configurable via serial or some sort of, you know, external interface. Um, that there just isn't like a nice graphical user interface to that we just take for granted for you know on a uh, commercial chips right because it's their custom board right yeah. they have the custom chip from APU or from AMD the APU but that's mounted on a board they designed and I don't know what yeah. controller they're using you know to to adjust the BIOS and same with driver updates you know one of the questions I had and one of the reasons that we don't have Windows testing on this is. On a Windows desktop, you would have to install drivers individually, like the graphics driver, modem driver, Wi-Fi driver, Bluetooth driver, all that stuff individually. And some of that, they're parting out chips, the controller mm-hmm. boards that, are, or, that are, have accessible drivers. But the graphics, because it's a custom chip, there is no AMD driver yet. Yet on the Steam Deck UI, they can deploy very much like a console, just a patch an update like the the uh, joystick drift that some new users had been experiencing was they said because of a regression in their firmware that mm-hmm. expanded the dead zone um, or tightened the dead zone so that there was some minor drift and then they just adjusted that or brought it back to the shipping state um, and issued a patch and same with graphics drivers and UI updates all through one system update button. I realized when I said that my my you know my biggest concern was. Compatibility. I was talking about controller compatibility because for mm-hmm. me, interf- interface is everything. Got but it. I think most people are talking um, when they hear that word, they're, they think of tech, uh, you know, performance compatibility. Yeah. And I, I got all those questions answered from your video, and I was really impressed to hear just how well it did perform. In fact, you said if you're playing, say, last generation console games like Xbox One era, PS4 era console games, you can run them at 60 hertz with settings pretty much maxed out. Yeah, yeah, that was the most impressive thing. Like, uh, Digital Foundry did a the, probably the best that I've seen benchmarking of this and analysis and comparison to both consoles and PCs. And one question that I couldn't answer was like, what does the graphics here compare to on a graphics card, right? On on the PC side, and they were able to say, you know, it actually compares like to a GeForce 1050. Ti or something, which is not a high end card by by any means, um, but it consumes more power than the the fifteen watt uh, <laughs> APU here. Yeah. Um, but the reason this can run God of War or you know Titanfall two, last gen game, right? Um, your Death Stranding at a high high frame rate is because what they're targeting here is a twelve eighty by eight hundred resolution. Screen. Yep. And so it it is really a apples and oranges comparison. And so the takeaway from watching the Digital Foundry review, because they did like a uh, comparison with Horizon Zero Dawn and God of War and, and with the PS4 versus the Steam Deck, is you're getting consistently more stable frame rates at 30. And for PS4, a lot of those games are 30 FPS games. Uh, you get more consistent frame rate, a, a, play, a play experience on the Steam Deck at 30 FPS and better performance if you unlock the FPS 
but at, at, at the same graphic settings, because a lot of these graphic settings on the console side are medium, not high, not ultra high. That's more of a PC thing. But of course, it is Apple's oranges because on a PS4, you're outputting 1080. Yeah. And a PS4 and I, Pro so 4K. I was wondering, did you, th- and this is going to be up to the developers. This is a game by game question. But did you find many games that were hard to read the text? Because 1280 by 720 is not really, is as you said, it's lower res than what is the de facto standard. And really, the, even was the standard last generation. Like if you're designing your game, you're probably targeting 1080p. The only yeah. the only platform that's going to be less than that is going to be Switch, and so you're you're kind of hoping that the games having have tested 720p due to the Switch compatibility. But I was wondering, like I know when I got Overwatch for Switch, it's illegible. Like you can't read text in that game because it's just too small. Did you have that problem on any games that you played? Yes and no. I was surprised that if I was, I played RTS on this, I played Rise of Nations and I could, I was putting my face closer to the screen to play it, but it was all readable. Okay. All the icons and everything was, and all the text was readable. It's holding it closer to your face or putting your face closer to it than the arm's length. I think a lot of games have accessibility options now that allow mm. for larger text. Mm-hmm. You know, even like Red Dead, I can, I blow, I, I, my, I'm, one of the first things I'm doing is expanding the map size and turning on, subtitles um but for games that don't have that adjustability yeah it's it's harder to read um nothing's illegible though there's nothing that's like oh that that icon or that number i can't decipher um i just have to go closer in great yeah and i asked you have you been playing it since you reviewed it you know i could i know a lot of tech is a lot of fun the first week but it sounds to me like you have been like you're enjoying it it's uh, allow me to play more games than i've been able, been able to just having children and a children sleep schedule uh, than I have in the past, you know, two years. That's encouraging. Um, and even if it's short bursts at a time, you know, going to play Hades at ten minutes at a time, fifteen minutes, you know, in a run or something, I can do that because I can put this in the living room, and when there's some downtime, I can pick that up and play. I don't have to go to my office. Yes, yeah, so I don't be separated from my family. <laughs> so the way that works, if you're in the middle of Hades and you can hit a suspend button, it's a power button. And the screen turns off, you put it down for an hour, you come back, you hit that suspend button again. How long until you're back at the point you left off? One second. Wow. <laughs> it, really? it literally is a suspend. And like, it's where you left off. It's not it's, the previous save state. Yeah, it's where you left off. They, they, they are caching everything that's running uh, in that moment, processing-wise, into the system memory. And it does do a little bit of battery drain because it's you know you have to keep it active. Yeah. But the moment you press that power on, it returns. Now there are games like online games where obviously if you suspend, you're losing the Wi-Fi connection. It's not getting any new signal. And on the server side, it's like oh this person turned off their computer. So if you resume that game, it's as if you lost internet. Right. Uh, even though the Wi-Fi will pick back up, you know the server might not recognize and, and you know resume your where you were. Uh, but the game itself will be loaded. It won't even go to like default to the menu. The only thing that changes is as you return from a suspend, it defaults, throws that top down, the, the top bar to show you battery and that your Wi-Fi is connected. That's pretty great. I mean, I I left Returnal like on the PS5 running because <laughs> there was no you know save at this point. I couldn't turn it off and, and come back to it later. Yeah. Um, so that like that's a global. You know, option now to games that don't even support that kind of suspend functionality. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then there's still things to do. You know, one of my criticisms is if they want it to act like a console, uh, but they also it's still very much the the PC mindset of like if you leave it on battery power, the screen turns off after 15 minutes, and then it goes into the deep suspenders deep uh, sleep mode. There's no half mode where if you have it docked or plugged in, it'll do background updates or downloading. Hmm. Like I want the, the way people think about consoles is, you know, you can have it plugged in and it can run processes, and so you can be have the latest version. You don't have to patch things as soon as you boot up. Like the thing that takes more time is like loading up Steam Deck and there's a patch for a game, and then I have to wait for the patch to download. Um, they also uh, release their own game. Uh, it's in the Aperture world, so it's a desk job, I think, and that was oh, released. Uh, I didn't know ago. that. Yeah, no kidding. 
So a first party Valve, simple game. It's more of a tutorial than anything. Kind of remember for VR, it's very much like what they did for um, the Index Controller. Yeah, they, they the outsourced that though. They they did, but they designed it, and you know they had the the Portal Two writing team on it. And, yeah, of course. Yeah. But Cloudhead did some of the coding and then the design for for that. I don't know whether that was the case here or the, okay. whether it was internal coders, but it's basically a glorified tutorial, right? It'll expose you to all the buttons and That's cool. have you use touchpads, but it's all in the Portal universe in Aperture Labs, and the writing is fantastic. And J.K. Simmons comes back, and there's like vo- great voice acting, uh, but it's the most beautiful and well-performing game <laughs> on here. Really? Like the amount they have, whatever version of Source Engine they're using, wow. they have optimized it for Steam Deck, this screen, because it's their first party, running at 60 FPS. There's anti-aliasing up the wazoo. It is gorgeous. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I wonder if this will become a target platform now for developers, you know? If like, they're just adding it to the mix, you know? Because when you're developing a game, you've got you've got to have all the icons look just right for every platform, you know? It's like the rule. You can't even. You obviously can't get a game published on the Xbox Store that has PlayStation icons in it. Like you, you've got to go across the board and make sure that it, all of your, um, you know, controllers look like the first-party controller of the platform that you're developing for. So I wonder if this will just be added to the mix, given that there isn't going to be that kind of rigid requirement by Steam to make it that way. <clears throat> They're open, you know. I think philo- philosophically, like they they want anybody to be able to put anything they want to on on the PC and thus on Steam Deck. But I wonder if just for user friendliness, if people, given if this is a popular device, and then maybe that's the deciding factor, if developers will you know make this feel make games feel like they're right at home on this device, where the touchpads are used for things that are like specifically designed to be that shape. You know, and then, you know, that size and width. And you, in addition, you have all the other buttons that aren't just sort of like analogs to gamepad buttons, but are actually designed to function in a certain way that makes sense for that um, that interface. Well, certainly the the desktop has that, like perfectly representations of those, the touchpads and where the triggers are. Uh, I think the fear of fragmentation would probably prevent kind of the exclusive features the yeah. Steam Deck. But I think from a UI perspective, there's certainly incentive for them. I mean, already you're seeing signs of that with both developers touting on social media that their game, one, is runs great on Steam Deck, right? But two publishers have posted whole suites like 2K or, you know, like, our, our games run great on Steam Deck, which is a sign that they're aware that there's a ton of people out there who are eager to play games on Steam Deck. Right. Uh, right now, it's like these up to a thousand games verified, but you know, however many hundreds of thousands of Steam Decks they end up selling this year, uh, that's a user base user base that's hungry to look for games to play. Um, the fragmentation also extends to the hardware side too, because if Valve has it their way, and other people start using Steam OS, like Dell or Razer or Aya, and, and incorporating Steam Deck on their versions of the a handheld gaming PC. They're not bound by Valve's specs, right? They could have a 1080 screen, or they could have a, a bigger APU or, or a GPU on there. Uh, and then developers are then kind of like, oh, okay, are we optimizing for Valve's version of this, like the Valve Index equivalent, or are we also optimizing mm-hmm. for mobile PC gaming as a whole with UI? So you get a lot of these questions. But I think it does feel like developers are keenly aware that a lot of people are going to have these. And it, the success of it is that more people are be playing PC games mm-hmm. more frequently because of portability. Hey, have you? Did you try? And I'm sorry if I missed this in your review. Did you try playing with a low battery plugged into a battery pack? Yes, yes, uh, and it works. So the battery packs I have are not. They're like <laughs> they're 15 watt output, right? Uh, and so it will charge the battery, but uh, at load, this is consuming 25 watts at full load. So playing a triple A AAA game, um, and so it just won't charge as fast as the battery uh, that you're consuming it if you're playing the game. But you will get extended life. You'll but get potentially, if you had a, a a battery pack capable of outputting more current, you'd be able to charge and play at the same time. 
Yeah, I mean, it would treat it just like the wall. The wall, it's 45 watts, and 45 watts is has a lot of overhead uh, because even though you're losing some efficiencies in, in, uh, in AC, uh, it's a 25 watt max power consumption at, at, at load. The system is designed thermally to never consume more than 25 watts, 15 watts on the APU, plus uh, up to 10 watts on display brightness, speakers, all the uh, powering the pad. Um, and then the 45 watt adapter also will charge accessories. So if you have a the, the steam dock, the whatever steam deck dock or a uh, you know a, a, a PD, a powered uh, USB hub, it will power your um, your right. uh, your keyboard or whatever you have plugged into USB. Um, it does get hotter. So one of the interesting things that we learned from the hardware teardowns is the way the thermals are designed. Like there's a fan in the back. Let's see. So if you're watching the video, there's a fan of intake in the back. Air goes through here and through the exhaust. And the, one of the big criticisms, aside from the you know the, the rapidly changing software, we'll say, is that the fan spins up like it, immediately. Like unless you're doing nothing, if you're just in the menu, it's actually a variable frame rate on the UI, but not the display. So it'll run if you're not moving through the the Steam menu, it's not going to refresh those frames for more than 30 FPS. Uh, but if you're in any type of game experience, it's going to spin the fan up, and you're going to hear it. I did find it annoying. It's kind of like you know playing a notebook, playing game and gaming on a notebook. Uh, but with a fan spinning up, it's intaking through here and passing through a bunch of components, right? And one of the components is uh, actually the uh, the charging IC, so the chip that manages the power and the power intake. When you have it plugged in, actually, it will get hotter than if you don't have it plugged in, because for it to consume power and refill the battery at the same time, so run GPU, APU, and top off the battery is a more power intensive task or a more thermal intensive task yeah. than just uh, running the game. Yeah, that, I yeah. think that makes that makes sense. Yeah. I feel like that's yeah. the case for laptops as well. Oh yeah, yeah, and but just not what some people think about. People are like, yeah. oh, when I'm plugged into power. I'm more optimized, but you know the energy's <laughs> got to go somewhere. You're, you're right. packing those electrons inside inside that lipo. Uh, I, I do wish, like I was looking into it, Switch, right? For example, has optimal like games are designed on Switch to run optimally, even when they're unplugged. Makes sense, right? You want to play Breath of the Wild on 720p on the Switch screen, but when you dock the Switch and you can output it, the Switch hardware can actually clock up more and it does consume more power because it can output then at 1080. That's what I want for the system. I want that when you're in dock mode and you have a HDMI out, it will overclock or they will maybe not it's not possible on this thermal design, but I want to be able to output 1080 and run games at 1080. Right now, when you plug it in by default, it's 1280 by 800 max, and you're using FSR or some type of scaling. To, to fill up your your HDTV. Oh, I didn't realize that. Any monitor you plug it into is locked to 1280. If you're in the Steam Deck UI. If you go okay. to the Linux UI and you run Steam there, you can up the resolution to 1080 or whatever you want. Interesting. But the most the most common use scenario, if you're just plugging in a HDMI and you're using the the, the user friendly interface, there is no customization yeah. uh, for your output. It is just mirroring or, and what's on the display while the display is off. So having spent some time with it, my last question is, if you had a crystal ball and you looked into it, what is Steam Deck 2 going to look like? Oh my gosh. Okay, so again, the, the iteration question, right? Like where, let's, let's, let's look at like what's going to improve, let's say in three years, right? AMD or whoever they partner with for a chip will have a chip that can be more power efficient. It's not about the most powerful chip. It's about what performance per watt you can have. That's a sweet spot right here. RDNA 2, the GPU here, it's more, way more power efficient than Vega. The CPU here actually is like last year's CPU, but it doesn't matter. It's about like at this wattage, what's the output? And so the question for Valve is, do they want to stick to a 15 watt target TDP for a next gen chip? Because mm -hmm. if AMD gives them a chip and they say we're still going to stick to a 15 watt, then they know okay, we have a hardware profile 
that is well designed for this fan speed, for this, the, you know, the, this form factor, this amount of battery uh, for 15 watts? Or do they say, with the new chip, we'll still target 1080 or 12, 1280 by 800, but we're going to only consume 10 watts. That means they can have a smaller battery and have the same amount of battery life, and they can run it. It can be lighter, or they can have the same size battery, and they can uh, have it last longer. You can't have it all. Like you can't say I'm going to want five hours of God of War at 1080 resolution, right? You know, on a chip that's and, and give me 60 FPS. Well, right? let, let's imagine that they will base their decision based on feedback from customers, and they'll yeah. base, you know, which will be where are the pain points. So that's that's what it comes down to. As since you've used it, you have a good sense of where you feel the deficiencies are. Is it yeah. battery life? I think they're going to find a compromise and, and increase the battery life to like a comfortable two hours. Right now, it's a comfortable one hour. It's like, you know, at, at max load, it's uh, almost two hours from full power to, to zero, but that's not how people really use phones or any mobile device. You have those like sweet spot of like 20 to 80% of like comfort before I start freaking out. And I think about how much damage I'm going to do to the lipo battery uh, or lithium ion battery. So I think you want a comfortable two hours. Mm-hmm. Um, if that means it's going to stay the same weight and weight, the pain points weight. Let's. I, I'm going to be honest. I think the pain points weight. I think the. I think if, if like if I'm going to make a magic ball prediction, I think valves and decrease the weight, but keep the battery life the same, and have performance be the same for newer games targeting 30 FPS, 1080, or 1280 by 800. Keep the resolution. Uh, keep the resolution as the default, but I want them to have a 1080 screen, render at 1280, and upscale. Use an internal scaler to ah. upscale uh, at the screen. But if there are games, then my my older games, yeah, my 360 era games, I can run at 1080 on this or output 1080 or an output 4K uh, with higher power consumption by plugging it in to power. Right. So maybe then you really want like a 2560 by 1440 display so that you could get a nice quad 720p. That's the power consumption on that that screen itself would be would would uh, consume too much. Yeah. But I'm just you're, thinking in terms of the graphics, like if you're going to have your native, you know, UI at 720, I don't know if you want to stretch that up to 1080. It does it's not even. It, I don't think that matters. That used to matter in the Windows days. Yeah. There's so much scaling that happens on the console side. You know, the games are rendering at 540 and then they right. go up to, to 1080, like non-integer scaling is a dot issue. Uh, and you can still have multiple versions of the UI. The UI front end can scale at 1080, and you're talking about game content scaling at something that's non-integer that hmm. is, is bumped up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. I think you know uh, the interviews that Gabe Newell has given has said that you know he said that they were surprised by how many people were willing to pay the higher price, right? And this goes to I said in my review like they didn't need to charge 400 for this, right? This over exceeds all expectations. 400 is like too good of a deal. Um, but the the thing is, it's it's market pricing, right? It's it's the price electricity, the perception. Like even in my review, I called it a four hundred dollar console. That is powerful for them, for people to speak of it as if it's a four hundred dollar is the most common price option. Kind of like Tesla, I thought about right. You know, the thirty thousand dollar Model Three was such a powerful marketing thing for them to say, uh, for people to think about entry level affordable quote unquote electric vehicles uh, when they're trying to introduce a new type of category uh, you know it, it, but most people never bought that were able to buy that and the thing is people will be able to buy it at 400 and Valve may be taking a loss maybe they can afford it um, they won't raise the price they've said but you know whatever Steam Deck 2 ends up being I can't imagine it'll be 400 it's going to be you know please put give, give us a wider range of options um Higher resolution screen. I don't well, want them to have different battery capacities. I think that's that's yeah, you no, know, and, and different performance profiles. But give us the the nice to haves on the higher end. Well, it's interesting that they did basically have performance parity with all three of their SKUs here this time around. I yeah. could, I think that having performance options would be right at home on PC. They're doing it on console, which <sighs> to me, like that was a, that was something that would never happen. But now, of course, you can buy the Xbox, you know, One S or X, or, or you can buy, you know, the PlayStation had its Pro thing. 
uh, with the PS4 generation. And uh, I could absolutely see Steam Deck having the pro line that is, you know, maybe twice as expensive and it has all the options that you want. Why well, don't have, I think a third party, they would rather have a third party do mm. that than do it on their own. I think there's a, there's value and it's, it's like a, it's a, <laughs> it's a catch 22, right? Like they're promoting the versatility of PC gaming, but also taking advantage of uh, a shared platform and, and shared specs and consistency for performance just for validating, creating a, a good user experience for first time PC gamers. Um, yeah. I, the, the, even the sh- the fragmentation on the console side, gamers don't necessarily like it, and it only works because not everyone has the uh, the TV. Like your your biggest difference is resolution, right? And so you can very easily kind of say the difference between Series S and X is you know thirty or sixty FPS or four K versus ten eighty. Mm-hmm. Like it's a nice delineating. People aren't going and changing their ambient inclusion and their shadow detail right. on, on console uh, even though you could on the pc side yeah uh, that that's like that's fragmentation that i think is off-putting for new pc gamers yeah yeah we'll we'll see um anyway takeaway is you've made me more excited about steam deck than uh, than i was before and i ordered one so i'm excited to get it like i was more excited throughout the play testing and review period because the potential of it i saw unfolding as I was using it more, one of the impressive performance was like I couldn't believe that it w- didn't feel compromised for those that category in GTA Five, Red Dead Redemption, uh, and then like Elden Ring coming out right when the game when, when the <laughs> system launched and playing well at yeah. native res, medium settings, above thirty FPS, that was mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, uh, and probably a game that I mean I'm guessing it's likely they didn't even they weren't even able to test on Steam Deck. Maybe they were. Maybe they were one of the few developers that got kits. But I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, people didn't have a whole lot of time with Steam Deck dev kits to make a whole lot of substantial changes. So it it apparently is just a powerful mini computer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, they said a couple hundred of these dev units are out there. It's a various, you know, and there and and we got to acknowledge this pushback too, right? Like Bungie came up very strongly to say, no, we will not support Steam Deck. Uh, Epic. Right, they they won't. But the next phase of testing and things to unveil will be the Windows experience and using this not as a Linux first system, but as a Windows first system. Which yeah. I don't think you need it, honestly. But for people will want to get around it to play, you know, their Epic games and the games that have specific um, piracy controls and, and requires. Yeah. yeah, Valve has positioned themselves as being very platform agnostic. <laughs> but it's clear that like they this is at launch designed to, to play games off Steam. And I'll be curious to see how easy they make it for Epic to get on the Steam Deck. Oh, they would be happy for for that. I, I they're gonna support it. I it, it's yeah, I I feel like they're not gonna hold anything back. Um I think people will quickly realize the, the dream of like using this as your primary computer in, in windows that's a rare right. rare case yeah 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 uh that's it i think that's uh the, all the all the primary questions you got jeremy that's all of the all the questions all, all right well if, <laughs> uh, well you, you help me think about other things that again i've been thinking about as i've been going through this process so i'll, I'll have more thoughts uh if people have questions out there and they w- want to know more about the steam deck more about how specific game runs, um, hit us up on Twitter and I'll answer there or the comment section of this video on YouTube. That that does it. That does it for our very Steam Deck, our reviews embargo heavy episode of the podcast. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me this week. My pleasure. Um, I don't know if I have an outro queued. Why don't we pull something from the classics? Oh, here's a good one. All right, here we go. Here's an outro. And everyone will see you next week, maybe with Kishore. See you next time. There, I didn't see you. That's it. There aren't a lot of desserts. Peach. Peach. Sweet peach? There's not. Peach. Peach. Sweet peach?
Fui nessa aqui. Good pick.